A common question that I hear as a board certified dermatologist and acne expert is what's the best oral antibiotic for acne? They're the most common pill systemic treatment that we use in the treatment of acne and we have a bunch of options. So when we're going to use an antibiotic, which one should we use? How should we use it? And you know, what might be the alternatives for those who'd like to avoid oral antibiotics? In this video, we're going to break down all of these issues. Now, before we start, make sure to hit the subscribe button and to like this video so we can share it with more in the community. The first thing I want to talk about is just what antibiotics do we use most commonly in the treatment of acne? About 50% of our antibiotic prescribing is doxycycline, which is in the oral tetracycline family of antibiotics. Then another 35% is minocycline, which is in that same class. We also use quite a lot of trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, which also is called Bactrim. About 10% of antibiotic prescribing is that one. Then about 5% of antibiotic prescribing are others like amoxicillin, cephalexin, and zithromycin. In addition, we have a newer antibiotic, serocycline, which is a narrow spectrum tetracycline that we'll talk about in this video as well. We don't have as much data about how commonly this is prescribed because it's a newer treatment, but that's another important option that we have in our acne treatment armamentarium. So let's start by talking about the oral tetracyclines, doxycycline, minocycline, and serocycline. What are their relative strengths and weaknesses? How might we want to use them? Since this is the most common class of oral antibiotics that we use for acne. And the reason that we use these so often is that they have a multitude of different ways that they can help. First off, they can kill C. acne's bacteria. The acne bacteria that we know is a fundamental trigger of acne. We know certain strains of C. acne's are associated with worse acne than others. But in addition, these oral tetracycline antibiotics have anti-inflammatory properties. Even at low doses, they can be helpful in the treatment of acne by inhibiting matrix metalloproteinases and other inflammatory mediators in our skin. So they have these dual modes of action. They can kill acne bacteria, and they can also have anti-inflammatory properties. In the clinical trials, they generally work quite fast. Usually within four to eight weeks, people are seeing improvement, and usually by eight to 10 weeks, people have really reached kind of the maximum improvement from these treatments. So compared to many of our acne drugs, which sometimes can take four to six months to reach maximum effectiveness, these are really fast treatments, which can be great for people who need to get their skin clear quickly for whatever reason. If we look at the individual members of this class, doxycycline is, again, the most commonly prescribed one, and for good reason. It works quite well when we do head-to-head -head studies of doxycycline versus minocycline, and there doesn't really seem to be any evidence that one's better than the other. I have a suspicion that serocycline is maybe slightly better anecdotally, but we don't have any head-to-head -head studies there. So doxycycline seems to work about as well as anything else. It does have some important side effects. It can cause sun sensitivity, so people can sunburn more easily on it, they can get kind of a phototoxic reaction to it. And because it is an oral antibiotic, it can potentially disrupt our microbiome or good bacteria in the skin. And this can lead to stomach upset and diarrhea. This can lead to yeast infections. This can lead to other side effects like that. It may carry some important long-term risks like increased risk of inflammatory bowel disease or other gut health issues, and maybe even increased risk of certain cancers like colon cancer. So we do have to be thoughtful when we're using oral antibiotics in the treatment of acne and other conditions. Minocycline has the advantage of not causing sun sensitivity compared to doxycycline, but it has some really important other side effects. Minocycline can cause a group of severe cutaneous adverse reactions, really bad kind of drug eruptions, the most characteristic being something called DRAS, or drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. And this can be a life-threatening kind of drug reaction. And so this is a really important and serious risk of minocycline that doxycycline doesn't seem to have. In addition, minocycline can cross the blood-brain barrier, which is another kind of difference from doxycycline. And in doing this, it can lead to neurologic side effects, so vertigo, kind of room-spending dizziness issues. It also is more associated with something called idiopathic intracranial hypertension, or pseudotumor cerebri, which is an increased pressure in the brain. Uh, and minocycline can also cause deposition in the skin and, leave, and bones and lead to dispigmentation. So sometimes people who have been on minocycline for a long time will get some discoloration on their extremities, like their lower legs or arms, and can sometimes get darkness in their acne scars themselves. So minocycline has some important side effect risk compared to doxycycline. Actually, for this reason, in the 2024 American Academy of Dermatology Acne Guidelines, we give a lower recommendation to minocycline in the treatment for acne than doxycycline. And in my practice, I honestly try to avoid using it when I can, because again, there's not really any evidence that it clearly works better than doxycycline, and it has some important additional risk in terms of serious drug reactions, neurologic side effects, and discoloration of the skin 
that we don't really see with doxycycline. And that advantage of being less photosensitizing, I mean, and as a dermatologist, we have a lot of strategies to protect people from the sun. So I feel much more comfortable trying to deal with that issue of doxycycline than potentially having those serious risks of minocycline. And so in my practice, I really try to limit the use of minocycline. And I really would encourage us in the community to think about using that less than we do right now as well. Now, the other antibiotic in this class, sericycline, is a really exciting new narrow spectrum tetracycline. This is like if you took doxycycline, made it great at acne stuff, and tried to make it bad at all this other stuff we don't want it to do, like hurting our gut microbiome. And when you look at in vitro data, it works great at getting rid of C acnes, it works great at doing the anti-inflammatory things, but it has 32-fold less activity against gram-negative enterobes, kind of our classic gut microbiome bacteria. Now, in practice, does this lead to actually reduced rates of long-term side effects in terms of microbiome? We honestly don't know. No one's done those studies yet, but at least at a theoretical level, it should be advantageous here. And we look at the clinical trial data for serocycline, it works quite well. It works seemingly on par with other oral tetracyclines, and anecdotally, I feel like it might even work a little better. And from a side effect standpoint, they have very low rates of these kind of microbiome ones we'd worry about. Less than 1% of people in the trials of serocycline had yeast infections. Less than 5% of participants had gastrointestinal side effects like nausea or diarrhea or stomach upset or those kinds of things. So it seems to be better tolerated than other oral tetracyclines. It's also once daily dosing, so it can be more convenient. And it seems to be less photosensitizing and not to have these serious adverse reaction risks that we see with minocycline. So it has a lot of advantages here. It's potentially more convenient to take with once daily dosing. It doesn't seem to have the sun sensitivity issue we see with doxycycline or some of the severe drug reaction issues we see with minocycline. And in theory, it's gonna be less impactful on our gut microbiome and our other microbiome of our body and may cause fewer other kinds of side effects or long-term risks. So it's a really exciting new option that we have for our patients with acne. And I have a feeling that as it starts to become more accessible, it'll be the main antibiotic we use when it comes to treating acne. Moving past the tetracycline class of antibiotics, we have trimethoprin sulfamethoxazole, or Bactrim, which I mentioned, is about 10% of antibiotic use for acne. And this treatment can be effective for acne. It doesn't have randomized controlled trial level evidence supporting it like we see with oral tetracyclines, but there is some case series level evidence that supports that it can work well, especially maybe for those who have more resistant acne and haven't gone better with other treatments. That being said, trimethoprin sulfamethoxazole can be associated with very severe reactions. It can cause something called Steven Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis, which is a very severe drug eruption with blistering on the skin that can often even sometimes be fatal. It's also, especially in younger individuals, like the people who would be treating for acne, can be associated with this acute respiratory distress syndrome, this very severe lung inflammatory reaction that also, again, can be fatal on in some individuals. And so this is a medicine I think we have to be really thoughtful about when using for acne. It doesn't really necessarily have a ton of evidence that supports how well it works. It doesn't necessarily have those anti-inflammatory benefits we see with tetracyclines. And it has some really meaningful and potentially serious side effects that can happen. And all rare are very important. And so this is another medicine that I think we should really honestly try to limit our use of for acne. Maybe in some rare settings, it's you know the option we have and it's the best one choice we have. But it's something, again, I think we should try to really avoid using. We're probably using more than is optimal when you think about some of these serious risks that can have and the uncertain benefits compared to other treatment options. Beyond these options, we also have some of those other antibiotics that I mentioned are kind of like 5%, so not used that often. These would be like penicillins, like amoxicillin or cephalosporins like cephalexin, and these can work well for acne. In my practice, amoxicillin can be a great option for those who either have reasons they can't be on a tetracycline like allergies or where it hasn't worked. Amoxicillin, I think, often can work quite well for people. It's, in my mind, safer than some of our alternatives like trimethoprin, sulfamethoxazole. And it's also a medicine that we can sometimes use even in pregnancy, which is another advantage and strength of it when we run into those scenarios. So amoxicillin can be a nice option that we have for those who need it. Um, cephalexin, kind of similar in terms of potential. And then azithromycin is one that I find used quite a lot internationally, less so in the United States. The dosing can be challenging because it can accumulate in the body. So it often needs to have a little bit of a more unusual dosing schedule compared to other oral antibiotics. And it has relatively limited data to support its effectiveness in acne, but there are some small trials that suggest it can work quite well. And I do think it can be on our list of options of things that we can use. The last oral antibiotic I want to touch on is Dapsone. And Dapsone, similar to tetracyclines, has two modes in which it can be helpful for acne. There's an antibacterial effect of it, 
but there's also an anti-inflammatory effect of it. Dapsone can inhibit the function of a kind of immune cell called neutrophils, which we know are important in inflammatory acne bumps like nodules and cysts and those kind of more postural kind of bumps. And so for those with really severe inflammatory acne, sometimes Dapsone can be a very valuable treatment when we don't have other options that are working or they're not tolerated. And so while it's not kind of a first line option for acne, it can be a good thing just to keep in mind for when we just don't have a lot of other good choices and we really need something that's gonna to help tone down that inflammation. The next topic on oral antibiotics that I wanna to touch on are lower dose regimens. So as we've discussed for especially oral tetracyclines, they have an antibacterial effect, but they also have an anti-inflammatory effect. So could we potentially use a lower dose regimen to capture that anti-inflammatory effect without maybe needing that antimicrobial effect and could that help us with side effects? And there are some trials looking at lower dose regimens of oral tetracyclines like doxycycline, either 20 milligrams once or twice a day, or there's a 40 milligram modified release version of doxycycline and looking at those in both acne and rosacea. And these lower dose regimens absolutely can work. They may not work quite as well as higher dose regimens, but they can be effective and you can show this in randomized controlled trials. They also tend to have less side effects. People often have less gut side effects, yeast infections, those kinds of things. So they may be a little bit less disruptive to the microbiome or more well tolerated than higher dose regimens. But the thing we have to keep in mind here is when it comes to antibiotic resistance, these low dose regimens can still exert selective pressure and can still lead to resistance. When we look at the data around low dose regimens, we see that actually in an in vitro setting, low dose regimens might increase the rate of bacterial resistance. This is exactly what Alexander Fleming worried about with penicillin is that if you underdose it, it might give the bacteria just enough to need to do something about it, but not enough to actually kill them. And so we see in an in vitro setting, these low dose regimens might actually be worse when it comes to resistance. And in practice, we can see in trials looking at different dosing regimens for oral antibiotics that even low dose regimens lead to resistance of a variety of different bacteria, staph, other kind of mucosal kind of mouth and gut organisms. So these low dose regimens, they do still contain risks of long-term antibiotic use. We should still use them thoughtfully but they absolutely can work and they often do have less side effects. So they can be a useful tool in our overall approach for treating acne, but we should be thoughtful about them just like any other antibiotic approach. The last thing I wanna to touch on with oral antibiotics is like how long should we use them? We talked about lower versus high dose regimens, but there have been a lot of guidelines and recommendations suggesting to try to limit the use of antibiotics to three to four, maybe six months in duration and then try to stop and get people off of them. And the challenge here is that oral antibiotics are not a disease modifying treatment. They're not like isotretinoin or treatments that can put acne into a remission, create long-term clearance. They can certainly help people get better, but when we're using them, we need to either use them as a bridge to some other maintenance treatment, whether that's a really good topical regimen or something else like spironolactone or a combined oral contraceptive that might be a slower treatment. Or we need to just think of them as a long-term treatment for acne. And honestly, I think that's okay. When we look at changes to the microbiome, work from Anna Jan shown that within a couple of weeks, you see meaningful changes to the microbiome with oral antibiotics. So the idea that like 2.9 months were fine and 3.1 months is bad, really just isn't supported by the data. Any use of oral antibiotics is potentially gonna disrupt our microbiome. And so I tend to be more on the side of, let's be thoughtful about who we give oral antibiotics to. Let's always be thinking about alternatives to oral antibiotics. But if we're gonna use them, let's also not be afraid to use them for longer periods of time when someone needs them to. Let's not arbitrarily just say, hey, it's three months, you're done, you can't have more. Because it's not like something bad is happening at 3.1 months that wasn't necessarily happening at 2.9 months. Of course, more is gonna be worse than less, but these changes happen quite quickly and they often do over time go back to normal, even if you've been on antibiotics for quite a long time, like a year sometimes. So I prefer to be thoughtful about who we give antibiotics and a little bit less worried about how long we give them to where if it's the only treatment that's working for someone's acne and there aren't other options that we can bridge to to get off of it, in my mind, you know, we can understand the risks of oral antibiotics, but we shouldn't be afraid to necessarily use more long-term regimens if that's the only option we have, if that's what we need, or that's what's working best for that individual. In the last section, I wanna talk about non-antibiotic alternatives. We've talked a lot about which oral antibiotic is best, but what about, again, just trying to avoid them? When we talk to patients with acne, about three quarters of them prefer a non-antibiotic alternative to an oral antibiotic if one such treatment existed. And fortunately, we do have a lot of non-antibiotic treatments that might be underutilized in our approaches to taking care of those with acne. The first would be if you're a female patient with acne, hormonal therapy. When we look at the data, those who receive hormonal therapies of something like a combined or a contraceptive or a spironolactone, 
they receive about three months less oral antibiotics than those who don't. And we look at treatment patterns over time. Although people often start on oral antibiotics, most adult women with acne end up on hormonal therapy over time. And so those are the treatments that people are ending up on. And we even have some data now from randomized controlled trials like the FASTI study, suggesting that hormonal therapy might work as well or better than oral antibiotics. Maybe we should be starting there. So being really thoughtful about who are candidates for hormonal therapy, both oral treatments and we have topical treatments. We have a topical antiandrogen class codrome that we can use in both women and men with acne. And these can be really valuable non-antibiotic strategies to addressing acne. The other big one is isotretinoin. So isotretinoin, absolutely not the right treatment for everyone. And we talked about it in much more detail in other videos on the channel. But isotretinoin is a disease modifying treatment. Those who complete a standard course of isotretinoin, which is typically five to eight months in duration, about four out of five of them will not have meaningful acne, will not need any more pill medicines or systemic treatments for acne going forward. And so they can be a really good way to help people avoid oral antibiotics. And if we know someone's gonna end up on isotretinoin eventually, it would be great to just start there and avoid having them all the time where they're not better and getting exposed to other treatments that might have their own side effects and just be done with things. So oral isotretinoin is probably an underutilized treatment as well. Of course, it has its own serious risk. We must use it thoughtfully. But for those who are gonna end on it potentially later anyway, if we can identify them and start sooner, we can potentially reduce our exposure to oral antibiotics and all of the side effects and harms that can come with that use. We know actually that oral antibiotics probably have a stronger association with inflammatory bowel disease and something like isotretinoin. So for those who are afraid of isotretinoin because of inflammatory bowel disease risk, we should be really thoughtful about the oral antibiotics too. They might actually be worse when it comes to picking between one of those two. So that's another option we have. And we know in studies looking at isotretinoin that those who get that often have been on antibiotics for many months to sometimes years. And so again, another opportunity to reduce our reliance on oral antibiotics. And then the final one would be thinking about some of our newer procedural treatments. We have options like 1726 nanometer laser, which we talk about in another video on the channel. We have light therapies like LED masks and photodynamic therapy, which can help to address acne and sometimes in a lasting clearance way, similar to isotretinoin. And these can be really nice alternatives for people who maybe topical treatments aren't enough or they're too irritating or who don't want to use topical treatments, but who don't have a lot of pill medicine options other than oral antibiotics. They can be a nice alternative there for someone just looking for a more procedural way to address their acne. And then of course there are lifestyle nutritional strategies. We know that high diets high in sugar are associated with more acne. We know certain vitamins and minerals can be helpful in treating acne. We have whole videos on those subjects, but those can be other non-antibiotic alternatives when we think about how to treat acne in a comprehensive and thoughtful way. Well, again, I hope you found this video helpful. If you have, please give it a like so we can share it with more in the community and subscribe to the channel. Your support really means a lot to me and it's what makes these videos possible. Ask me your questions about oral antibiotics and share your experiences in the comments below so we can all learn from each other. Until next time, see ya.